everybody. Thanks for coming tonight. Awesome. The last time I did this, it was two days before COVID lockdown. That really sucked. So, so I'm so glad you could come tonight. We will be talking about Menominee Falls and some of the history way back in the way back, way before my time. Uh, this is the original Menominee Falls right here. That was, that was the map, the survey map from the 1836. There was only one person here at that time when that was done. Only one person in Menominee Falls at that time doing this. Joe, was that the town of Menominee? This, it wasn't the town, it wasn't anything back then. But, <laughs> it was but just, what did you have shown on the map? On the map. It, well, this is, it, it shows the whole area of what Menominee Falls was. You know, the, the, the town was up, up at the top up there. But this was, it says map of the township. Okay. But it was, this was the whole, what is it, 30 some square miles, 33 square miles. So, if anybody has anything to add, just jump right in. Can you hear me? Yes. Wonderful. So this all sounds very simple, this immigrating to America. It's quite easy for a young man to leave his country and go on a strange journey to strange places. He can come back anytime if he wants. There's quite a difference for a family to sell out all their belongings and leave behind for good all that has been dear and holy to them. The land where their ancestors and near relatives have lived and died and are buried. The uncertainty of a strange land over 5,000 miles away across the ocean. A land where an entirely strange nation resides and unknown language spoken. This is no undertaking for a weakling. Only those with a strong desire and people who are determined to brave anything. Such were our ancestors and all the people who settled here and made this their village. Welcome to the streets of Old Menominee Falls, part one. This presentation is gonna take you on a walk up the big hill on a street that has had many names. It began as an old Indian trail that connected Milwaukee, Green Bay, and Fond du Lac. It was named the Green Bay Trail. In the 1830s, William Robinson Hesk improved the road and later it was renamed Fond du Lac Road. In 1922, under much celebration and fanfare, the Fond du Lac Road became part of the state highway system and it received designation as State Highway 15. It was called the longest stretch of concrete in Wisconsin. In 1953, this road was taken into the interstate highway system as I-41 and renamed Appleton Avenue. And did you know that Appleton Avenue is part of the transcontinental automobile highway that stretches from Plymouth, Massachusetts to Seattle, Washington on the West Coast. But I'm getting way ahead of myself here. I'd like to tell you a story about some of our first buildings, businesses, and homes and houses on what is now Appleton Avenue. What they were, where they were located, who lived and worked there, the owners and their families. What happened to them and, and what's there now? We will start with the earliest known settler here. This is William Robinson Hesk. William was born in Yorkshire, England in 1796. 38 years later, because of political unrest, he left behind his wife and two children and he came to America. He settled in the middle of the wilderness in August of 1836. It was right before that map was made on land which was then still part of Milwaukee County. Now in 1839, he paid $200 and was granted a patent on his 160 acres of land. It was going for the rate of a buck and a quarter an acre, and this was comparable to paying over $6,000 today. Now this, is, this was his property right here, this square piece. This is Pilgrim Road right here. And this was all of Hesk's property. That's everything that he bought. But at the time he bought that, none of these other people were there. There was nobody else. My mom's hitting the wrong button. There was nobody else here. It was just him. Back then, what is now our Main Street was called North Prairieville Road. And our Pilgrim Road was known as Old Menominee Falls Road. So we've got... This is... This is... Main Street here, 
or North Prairieville Road. This is Old Menominee Falls Road or Pilgrim Road. So William then made a quick trip back to England to remarry and he returned to America with his bride and he moved into a new stone house. He then built his traveler's home and they settled in. In 1840, Hess was the first, well here, this is an overlay, yeah, this will give you a little, I'm moving, uh, this will give you a little idea, okay, of what his land was. This is Menominee Avenue, this is Lily Road, this is Main Street, this is Pilgrim Road. That is everything that Hess owned, including where we are right now. If you stand on the corner of Menominee Avenue and Pilgrim Road and look northeast, everything, that was all his land. So in 1840, Hess was the first owner of this beautiful home that still stands 182 years later on Pilgrim Road. Does anybody recognize that? Absolutely. Yeah, on Pilgrim Road. It, just up a ways from where his traveler's home was. This is 182 years old and has been continuously lived in. It is the oldest house in Menominee Falls that has been continuously lived in. Now this is a drawing of the traveler's home. It was a frame construction with big oak beams and posts, and it measured 20 feet by 30 feet, and the inside had oak boards partially split, spread apart, and nailed to the studs. The plaster was put over this. It contained a kitchen and a large sitting room with a fireplace, and a bedroom, and this was all on the first floor. Now, a spiral staircase led to the upstairs bedroom, and a small further section was added to provide two more bedrooms, and these had separate outside entrances. And you can see that here, they, they did make a, a note of that. Right here, they showed a window, but this actually was the other door. This was the addition that was put on there. Now this is what stood on the corner of Menominee Avenue and Pilgrim Road, kind of where the Jiffy Lube is right now. Or, no, Pizza Hut, it would be Pizza Hut. So an advertisement from the Milwaukee Courier dated January 19, 1843 states, Traveler's Home. The subscriber has opened a public house bearing the above name at Menominee Falls, 14 miles from Milwaukee on Fond du Lac Road. He has convenient lodging rooms, stabling, and all the appurtenances that should attend a public house and hopes to give satisfaction to all those who may favor him with a call. Signed, W.R. Hesk. Now this was a popular gathering place. It was a way station for the stagecoach. William catered to travelers going north on what was then uh, the former Indian Trail between Chicago and Green Bay. The first post office was established here in 1843, 42, and the 212th post, uh, 200, it was the 212th post office in, in Wisconsin, and Hesk was our first postmaster from May 1843 to November 1845, and he earned $67 his first year, which was 60% of the total sales for that year. Now, up until Hesk was postmaster, people had to make the long trips to get their mail from Milwaukee or Waukesha. So now this eliminated those long trips to get the mail that was so important to our first settlers. So now picture standing in the intersection of Pilgrim and Menominee Avenue almost 200 years ago. You are in the middle of nowhere. It's a forest. It's a Wisconsin wilderness. With the exception of the occasional traveler or the stagecoach that might stop, you are completely alone until the Indians show up. Now Hesk did have some trouble with the Indians and they, were, they just lived a little bit south of where Hesk was. They would try to get at his liquor that he sold along with the tobacco and other small items that he would try to sell to passing travelers. And for many years, children would find arrowheads in that general area. Now the main Indian trail to Green Bay passed directly by his traveler's home. It was just east of Old Menominee Falls Road, known later as YY, now known as Pilgrim Road. He was employed by the Road Commission in 1841 to help open up a wagon road north to Fond du Lac. Now this meant cutting a swatch through that forest along the trail and laying logs over the swampy area. Now this was still crude, but it was much better than the original Indian Trail and it enabled all the wagons to pass more easily. The first town meeting was held April 5th, 1842, at the home of William Hesk. Hesk and Friedrich Nays were two of the largest landowners at the time. 
At that first meeting, village officers were elected and William was voted as chairman of the Board of Supervisors. He held that position five times. He was treasurer three times, supervisor twice. Now this was comparable at the time to being village president. Our actual first village president wasn't elected until 50 years later. In March of 1892, after the village was incorporated, and it was Garwin Mace. He's in another presentation. We'll talk about him later. He was also on the committee of overseers of highways, commissioners of common schools, and he held the position of our first justice of the peace for 11 years when Congress passed an act in 1843 enabling Wisconsin to set up a state government to prepare for statehood. The first state constitutional convention was called, and Hesk was chosen to represent the town of Menominee as a delegate. And after two and a half months in Madison, the 124 delegates presented the first proposed constitution to the people of Wisconsin. Now John Brown was a widowed neighbor who was a friend of William and his wife Elizabeth. Now whether he persuaded them or Hesk and his wife offered, nobody is sure, but two of the smaller Brown children, actually named Elizabeth and William, were left to live with the Hesks around 1848 and remained with them for a number of years. And it's also said that another one of the older sons also came to live with them later on. Now by 1850, William had sold all but his 50 acres of land. He kept the land on Pilgrim Road that included his home, the traveler's home, and the river that ran through it. Okay, so now we've got, here we've got Pilgrim Road, Main Street, so he sold all of this land. So see the little boxes? That's his house. That was at that home, that beautiful home that's still on Pilgrim Road. And here's the river that runs through, and that's where the traveler's home was. So he just kept that. He sold everything to Lily Road, everything north up to Main Street. He just kept this little piece here. Now, also known as Uncle Billy, he was said to have been very successful at growing rutabagas. One crop was even mentioned in the 1857 Waukesha paper as averaging about 30 inches in circumference and weighing at least 15 pounds. That's one heck of a rutabaga. In the beginning of September 1859, he suffered a heavy loss when his barn accidentally caught fire. There was some hay burned, a new wagon, a complete set of farming tools, and a valuable crop of grain. The total loss was over $1,000. He had only $350 worth of insurance. Mr. Hesk was also badly burned in the attempt to save his property. In 1860, he was a member of and also served in the assembly at the 13th session of the state legislature. His last act for the town was as town chairman in 1865. Some people called him Major Hesk, as his, he, it was said that he was to be a man of great good sense, a warm friend and a useful citizen. There actually was talk, and we'll get to that later, but when they settled Menominee Falls, it was Fallsville to begin with. And then they wanted to name it Naysville in honor of Friedrich Nays. I always thought they should have named it Heskville. He did more for, than anybody else to get to establish the village. But anyway. Now William's second wife, Elizabeth, the one he married when he went back to England, uh, she died in September of 1865. And after 30 years of Menominee Falls, by the end of the year in October, William sold his property to the Filippi family. Really? Yeah, the ones we know. And made a move to Detroit. He had intended to spend the rest of his days with relatives there, but by the 1870 census, William was back here and married for a third time. His next door neighbor had been Joseph Pilgrim, who, whom Pilgrim Road is named after. And... Joseph had settled here some eight years after William, and he died 11 years later. So William's new wife was the widow of Joseph Pilgrim. She outlived William by almost a year, and they're all buried out at Emmanuel Cemetery. Now the Filippi family, they built a new farm home in 1905, and the traveler's home that was on their land was moved next to the barn. It was stripped of its wing addition and was used as a machine shed, and one addition was saved to use as a summer kitchen, while the other log addition was destroyed. Okay, so the log addition is destroyed. This was the summer kitchen right next to the house. And then I've got some pictures. There we go. Now that's what was left of the traveler's home. They just used it for a shed. But that was over 100 years after it was built. 
and it was still standing. Isn't that incredible? Now these pictures were taken in 1940, 100 years after it was built when it was still standing on the Philippi farm. So now William never lived to see the incorporation of the village. He died June 11, 1879 at the age of 83. And since he left no children here, the name Hesk died with him, at least here in America. He still had two children that he left over in England. He never made the fortune he dreamed of by coming here, for he only had $936 to his name when he died. But instead, he left a part of himself in the founding of this village through his active participation of the governing of its affairs. His obituary read, in all the relations of life, he has borne the reputation of a man of strong native common sense, of unquestioned integrity, firm decided conviction. The democracy of the town of Menominee Falls will miss their old and tried and true leader. And what's there today? There we go. That's what's there today. If you stand in the parking lot at Walgreens and look over by Pizza Hut, everything you see past there, that was what William Hess had. So now we're gonna head northwest. We're gonna walk up a ways until we stop at the bottom of the big hill. One of the little known claims to fame of this village was the Ginseng Company of Menominee Falls. It started around 1906 and it flourished until late 1920s, early 30s. A patent was taken out in May of 1922. Now this is George, Mr. George Nye. He's the one that owned and operated the local plant and he was using the water furnished by a spring that was in the village. The ginseng was a very healthful drink that rivaled Coca-Cola at the time. It was advertised as a beneficial beverage which now takes the place of harmful liquors. It also had a centuries old reputation as a medicinal root. It was billed as a nerve tonic with soothing qualities but also as an energizing beverage with no harmful effects. Going back to the Coca-Cola that had cocaine in it. It was also said to neutralize the after effects of alcohol if it was mixed in with the drink. Ugh. Menominee Falls was an ideal place to make a healthful tonic. We had our own spring-fed stream and ginseng was common to the area. The business was located on Appleton Avenue at the bottom of the big hill. The company grew its own ginseng in a garden nearby, processed the plant stems, leaves, roots, and all, and then carbonated the spring water and bottled its very own beverage. Now, not only did George bottle ginseng, but every fall, well, now this is something new that I just found out yesterday. While I was doing my research, I came across the fact that not only did they do the ginseng, but a hundred, a hundred, yeah, as we say in the falls, a hundred years ago this week, George and his sons enlarged the business. They made the big business bigger and they actually got a brand new, up to date, modern 1922 cider press, which was in operation not even three weeks later. So, just a little side note there. So now, even though it started in 1920, uh, his steam cider mill was in operation every Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday of every week. As long as apples were available, the plant worked overtime as farmers from miles around came with wagon boxes full of apples and a couple of brandy barrels to hold the juice. Apples were always plentiful and made a great cider. Now being that this was during prohibition, the customers were also advised to take those filled barrels home and just leave them in the backyard <laughs> and nature would put the kick in almost overnight, making everything legal and above board. But back in the day, Appleton Avenue was much steeper than it is now and it was actually too much for the old Model T's to go up the hill. They actually had to turn the car around and have their car go in reverse to get up the hill. So when progress came to the area, Appleton Avenue was leveled out, well, as leveled out as it is now, and the big hill was cut way down and our first sewer was put in. The contractors cut through the course of the local spring that the ginseng plant used. 
The strata formation several feet below the surface of the street was hard pan and gravel, and a vein of quicksand caused much difficulty and a substream was cut off, and this resulted in the drying up of the spring, as well as some of the wells in the vicinity. After the trench was finished, whatever water made its way back was seriously diverted. Even despite incessant rains at that time, there was no more flowage, and even the ice pond of Charles Walterlin went dry. That meant there would be no source of ice for the villagers that next year. The Ginseng Bottling Company asked the village for a settlement for the damages inflicted by reason of the main sewer trench as laid has completely dried up the Indian Spring, which enjoyed an uninterrupted flow of excellent medicinal waters for over 80 years. It was claimed that by proper construction at the time of the laying of the new sewer, this all could have been averted. Soon after, the ginseng company, run by Mr. Nye and his two sons, Hugo and Albert, were put out of business. Hugo moved out west. Albert stayed in the falls, as did George and his wife, Catherine. They had a house at the bottom of the big hill. Another side note. Anybody know who Vic Perrin is? Okay, for those who don't, well, by 1957, when Hugo died, his daughter Jan married Vic Perrin. He, for those of you who don't know, he is the control voice in The Outer Limits. You know, there's nothing wrong with your television set. That's Vic Perrin. He is probably the most famous actor to come out of Menominee Falls since my cousin Richard Greeley. So for years after, the bottling equipment was stored in an attic until Robert Corr from Chicago found it and actually revitalized the drink for a time. By the end of August 1931, the plant was sold at sheriff's auction. There was only one bid, Mrs. Louise Klug, who also held the mortgage on the premises. She paid the sum of $5,125.08. This included four lots on Lower Fond du Lac Avenue, now Appleton Avenue, together with the building and machinery used in the manufacture of the soft drinks. We have no information as to the precautions taken to ensure the purity of that spring water, but of course the Native Indians and the early pioneers, they depended on such waters and most of them survived to a normal lifespan. So now George, he was born in 1866 near Barton in Washington County and he was actually a carpenter by trade. He followed that trade for many years when there still was timber in these parts. And back in the day, he managed a sawmill that had been owned by Frederick Nays and run by his son, Charles. Six years before George died, he was in charge of a millwork, millwork plant. So now in February of 1935, George was on his way uptown after leaving the millwork shop. He collapsed on the sidewalk. He cut his forehead and he was carried over to Thomas Hardware where old Doc Doman pronounced him dead from heart failure. He's buried at Sunnyside Cemetery with his wife, Catherine. Another side note. This past year with the Historical Society, we received a letter from a man in Arizona. He, he wrote us saying, he found this at an antique store in Arizona. Now, if you look real close, you can see Nye's famous spring, Menominee Falls, Wisconsin. And if you remember George's picture with the truck, should we go back? Let's look at that. Let's go back and look at that for a minute. Okay, here's George. See, now look, there's George. George always said that this was his air-conditioned truck because it was all open. But here, if you see on the back, all these crates on the back, and those, that is what that crate is that he sent. He asked us if we wanted it. We said, yes, please. And you know, we would love to have this to make a display, you know, at, at our Old Falls Village. And that's the last we heard of him. Ah, uh, Clyde, what can I say? So... Is that his name? That was his name, Clyde. Yeah, Clyde from Arizona. He said what was in there were shoe shine equipment. I don't know. Just found it at a rubber sale. How it got to Arizona, who knows? So what's there now? 
Player's Pub, right at the bottom of the big hill. Player's Pub, that's where the ginseng was all behind there, and uh, the ginseng bottling company was, was, uh, was right there. So isn't that just before where the, the drive used to go down, where the soap place was? And remember when we were kids, you would take it, you, there was a little road that went back behind there? I know, right, right past there was where the, was the, where the shack was, a little bit further down. Wasn't that where the shack was that the boys would pick up their newspapers? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah I, was, I was right in Khan's parking lot, or yeah. Pop's parking lot now, Bob. Across from Khan's is where that road was. Right. Yeah. I remember going down there by myself. My mm -hmm. mother was a Nye, and oh. my relatives that were from the Nye started in Barton, so I have to, yeah. I have to figure out how George is related. Find me some more pictures, Bob, please. I need more pictures of George. That's the only picture I have of him. I need some more. All right, so we're going to cross the street, and we're going to continue walking, and we're going to head up the big hill until we reach the top. Frank Kaler was born in Mequon, August 1st, 1859, and was one of 13 siblings. This is Frank and his wife and their children. The family had only come to America some 11 years prior, and as a boy, he helped to clear away the forests of the homestead. He worked hard and enjoyed few days of rest. At an early age, he apprenticed himself to a wagon maker in Thienesville for three years. Before he was of age, he launched out for himself, and he went to Teresa. He only stayed there a year or two, and then he came to Menominee Falls. With the money he had saved, he bought out a blacksmith named Grimmer and immediately started his wagon shop. He began business on April 1st, 1881, and developed an ever-increasing business in the field of agricultural implements, and he kept up the work of repairs and providing parts for all farm machinery. Less than a year later, on the 25th of February, 1882, Frank married Catherine Schunk. They had a little white cottage with green shutters, and it was surrounded by a picket fence. And that was the Kaler's first home when they were married. Their union brought them seven children, William, Frank Jr., Walter, Lucy, Marion, Jenny, and Lily. Mrs. Kaler remembered back then, there were no automobiles, just an occasional wagon that would creak slowly by the house, going south to Milwaukee or, or north to Fond du Lac. Frank was a wagon maker, and his shop was right next to the cottage, and the children played with the wood chips and shavings on the floor around the shop, and farmers would stop to have a broken spoke repaired. If the crops had been good and there was some cash on hand, one of them might even want to order one of those one-man top buggies to the envy of the neighborhood. Well, times changed and the factory buggies came in and the day of the handmade vehicle was over. Frank then became a buggy salesman. And when automobiles supplanted horse-drawn vehicles, he then switched to selling farm implements. Frank Kaler built this house in 1893. It still stands on the corner of Garfield and Appleton. When this building was erected, the little cottage was moved to the back to make room and was rented out for a number of years. After a while, it was no longer rented, and it stood vacant. And young boys, well, they shattered the windows with rocks, and, and the floors were creaky, and the green shutters no longer fit snugly. Mrs. Kaler thought to tear it down. But her son, Willie, said, oh, let it stay, Mama. Now this mindset would get him in a lot of trouble years later as executor of his father's estate. His father owned two other properties on West Main Street. The village board ordered Will to tear down those unoccupied buildings. They were right across the street from the school and not only were unsightly, but were thought to be a danger to the lives of the school children. So Kaler's implement business is in the background. That's, that's the implement business that was right next to the shop. That's like the best picture and only picture we have of it. Kaler's implement business entered this horse-drawn hay tetter in the 1915 Fourth of July parade. The sign on top says, trade at Menominee Falls and have no kick coming. It was actually our village slogan at the time. Now standing next to the wagon is Frank's oldest boy, William. He's the one standing on the right. Now note the curtain in the right window. See right over there? 
This let Frank sit in his home by the window and he could keep his eye on the store next door. Now on the back of this picture, William's son, Charles Kaler, wrote for his father. A pretty house for 1893. There were only a few C3022 houses in Menominee Falls nicer than ours. I'll bet father laid a good many of those bricks himself, not only to save labor costs, but because he had so much energy, he couldn't help himself. I remember the day. I remember the day this picture was taken. Jenny was crying. Note her hat. Walter had run away and father had to run after him. The picture was taken during the noon hour. Note, I have a book in my hand. And note, Frank, always in the back. He was always sort of apart. And my coat, I remember it was black velvet, edged with brown fur. And Jenny's hat, I remember that puff on the top, it was red velvet. We're not at home, we're over in the community center. Lily and I both have Zippelkoffs, tassel hats. And they were kind of a blue with white stripes. Father has a mustache. A very nice memory of a family who have all long since died. Walter, he was the baby. They nicked him Beanie, nicknamed him Beanie, the little one who ran away right before the picture was taken. As an adult, he had gotten a job as an agriculture instructor. And he had moved from Trenton to Palmyra, Missouri with his wife, Grace, and bought a farm in 1932. Several weeks later, while pruning a tree in his yard, he fell out of the tree, broke his neck, and crushed his spine. He was only 33 years old. His widow Grace moved to Iowa. Frank moved to Madison and then Chicago. Mrs. Marion Weber lived in Chicago and moved back to the falls. Lucy, she was a teacher in Honolulu, Hawaii, who for many years would occasionally come back to the falls and she would give slide presentations about life and schools on the island. This is Jenny's wedding. Now Jenny, she married Roy Cooley and moved to Lafayette, Indiana. Lily married Charles Karch and lived in Wausau, then moved to Baraboo, and then moved to Merrill, Wisconsin. William, he suffered severe injuries to his face when in January of 09, he was kicked in the face by a horse that was in his father's livery barn. Good thing the horse wasn't yet shod. Willie's upper lip was split and it required 10 stitches. This must not have left too bad a lasting impression though because he married Annie Lund in June of 1917 and five months later he was elected the county clerk of Waukesha County. He held that position for many years until 1944. All right. Frank Kaler spent 48 years in this village. He led an active, upright, and thrifty life. He saw to it that every one of his sons and daughters were afforded a good education. He was industrious. He was frugal. He made a success in the way of his business, which he never neglected. He was a true type of the early day tradesman, a busy and energetic merchant. He was a member of St. Paul's Evangelical Church and was a charter member of the modern Woodman Camp that was organized in the early 1890s. He served as village trustee when we were newly incorporated. Frank died July 6, 1929. Catherine followed him seven years later. They are both buried in the family plot at Sunnyside Cemetery with five of their seven children. The house was converted into a duplex in the 30s and Ray and Marguerite Zahn took it over as their residence when they operated the movie theater in the 30s and 40s. 100 years after it was built, this building was put on the state's 10 most endangered properties list. It was in poor condition and the village wanted to raise it, but it was rescued by Falls Family Fun Fest. They bought the building and took care of the renovations. Around 1977, it became our Chamber of Commerce. And what's there now? You betcha. Fiddleheads. Or as my friend says, fiddlesticks. <laughs> Our next stop is on the other side of William's buggy shop. Now back in the day, the local firefighting force consisted of a bucket hanging off the back porch of those living along the river. With a number of fire losses in previous years, a special meeting of the village board in 1894 decided on the organization of a volunteer fire company. 
The first meeting established the election of John Hebner as fire chief. And the 22 members present also decided to change the group's name from Menominee Falls Fire Company to Menominee Falls Volunteer Fire Company No. 1. Subsequent meetings established practice on every Tuesday, and the Emmanuel Evangelical Church Bell served as their signal. Now, after a dance was held to raise the $2,000 needed, there was an acquisition of a two-cylinder hand pump hose cart and a horse-drawn fire wagon. Now, each volunteer fireman had to buy his own cap, though. Subsequent meetings saw the appointment of axemen, nozzlemen, a captain, second captain, a coachman. Torch boys were also appointed to keep the fire wagon's lamps fueled with kerosene and to keep the harnesses oiled. They were called out on their very first fire at half past three in the morning on December 1st, 1894. The company made it to the residence in short time to find the fire consisting of the chicken coop, the outhouse, and the smokehouse where the fire started. The buildings were almost consumed by the time they got there, but everyone was very impressed by the stream of water that was produced by this new hand pumper in putting out what was left of the fire. Didn't take much. Our newly formed company, showing off their equipment, marching in the Decoration Day Parade, May 10th, 1895. They had to buy their own uniforms, too. By 1898, the first engine house was complete. It cost $2,000, and the money was raised by having the first fireman's dance. OK, why is there such a high tower? What? Watch for no, not to watch for fires. They actually needed such a big tall tower to hang the hoses out to dry after the fire. You can't pack that away wet. So they would hang the hoses down until they were dry. And then after they dried, they could roll them up and put them away. So now, the building to the right, that was Caesar's blacksmith shop. The building to the left was the firehouse where the equipment was stored. Upstairs in the firehouse was where the meetings were held. The building in back was the village hall. Behind the village hall was the original jail. And the old timers used to say that the jailers would get smoked out during their vigilance over the jailbirds that were sometimes kept there for whatever misdemeanor. This was done, so they say, by covering up the chimney up above. Since then, the old days, the building was transported to William Rother Mills Farm, just east of the village. Now that was William Hesk's house. Remember, we talked about him very first. Now William Rother Mill, okay, another side note here. So William Rother Mill, he owned that house. Um, his daughter married Tom Watson, and Tom was actually president of the Historical Society for many years. Well, uh, Tom's wife grew up there. That was her home. Her father was Colonel Rother, Rother Mill. The other street on that house is King's Highway. Now, Colonel Rother Mill used to have a horse named King. And he used to exercise that horse up and down that road. And that's how King's Highway got its name. Ta-da! So that's where the jail was moved to. Uh, and then... Uh, Later in April of 1840, 1946, sorry. In 1946, it was sold to Ray Victor, and it was moved. OK, another side note. OK, we got horses. Now, these, these horses, they were fast. They had to be fast to get to where they were going. When the fire department got rid of the horses, and they became mechanized, my grandfather actually bought two of the horses. My father rode with him the first time he used them. <laughs> Passes that he hooked up the horses, they were ready to go to town. He goes, yeah, and he says those horses ran like a bat on a... <laughs> they did not know they weren't going to a fire. They didn't understand yet. It took them a while. Pa said that was the fastest ride he ever had in his life. But they were good horses. They lasted quite a long time. All right, and what's there now? It's the parking lot right next to the hot house. So now... You gotta remember, on the corner we got, on the corner here we got the Kaler house. Right next to that was his implement shop. Right next to that was the firehouse, the fire station. So the fire station was kind of half in the parking lot and half where, where the hot house is because you still need room. This, I'm gonna punch the wrong button, just watch me. 
This building here, this is Thomas Hardware. We'll get to that in a second. But there was still Caesar's back blacksmith shop. And then you had the firehouse. And when, when the hothouse was rebuilding and re, redoing, remodeling, and they were fixing their parking lot, which they're working on right now, they found the foundation. And they didn't know, they found a foundation. They didn't know what it was. And I told them, I said, well, that's the foundation from the original firehouse. And they were quite impressed. They thought that was pretty cool. So now we're going to keep walking up the street. And next door we find, up to 1942, the name Fred Thomas had been associated with the hardware and plumbing business and was the only business holding the same firm name for more than 40 years. Fred Thomas was born in 1873. He was raised, educated, and spent his entire life in the village of Menominee Falls. He first learned the tinsmith trade from Otto Linden, and later he worked for George Klippel in Richfield. Now, after a few more years, he opened up his own shop in 1893 at the top of the big hill. It was across the street. He later moved his shop to Main Street, where the harness shop had been. That was Andrew, uh, Andrew's harness shop. Now it's the American Legion Post. That's where, okay, that's where his uh, shop was. And there he added a few hardware items. The main items for sale were coal and wood ranges, kerosene lamps, and hand washing machines. The old-fashioned coal stoves were often the type with isinglass doors and the hard coal dumped in the top of the stove. Now, all the items at that time were floor items with no shelves for smaller items. Those were sold later on. Now, better known as Fritz, he married Olga Walterlin in 1903. Her father, Francis, is the one that owned the Eagle Hotel. So in 1904, oh, here's another picture. There's the whole wedding party. They look like they're exhausted. <laughs> what a fun wedding day. <laughs> so in 1904, tinsmith Fred Thomas, he built a hardware store on Fond du Lac Avenue, now Appleton Avenue. He added a larger hardware line with plumbing, heating, sheet metal work. Fritz and Olga had two children. The firstborn child was named Juanita. Olga's nephew had married and moved to Argentina. This might have influenced her to give her daughter a Latin name. Now, four years later, when a son was born, it was assumed he would be named Friedrich after his father and his grandfather. Not so. He was to be named Juan. His uncle, Charlie Horn, who was married to Annie Walterlin, a sister to Olga, the boy's mother, was to be godfather. But when the day of the christening arrived, Charlie went up to the altar and said, I christen thee Benjamin. <laughs> Needless to say, Charlie was not held in high esteem after that. As he grew up, Benjamin was better known as Sport. And for a while, Sport worked as projectionist across the street at the local show house until he decided to get into the hardware business with his father. Now, advertising back in the day was a big part of any business and Thomas Hardware did its share. In May of 1909, Fred offered coupons when customers made their purchases. These could be accumulated and cashed in for fine art plaques and cut glass, etc. Their newspaper ads could be simple and direct or very subtle. They could be informative and show a picture of what merchandise was for sale, or they could be large and flamboyant like a parade float. Now, years ago, the village held the 4th of July picnics in John Martin's Grove and Apple Orchard, now where the North Middle School is located. People brought their own lunches, and during the day, games were held for adults and children, and the parades were held about 11 a.m. Thomas Hardware never missed the opportunity to always have a float in the parade. The celebration lasted until after the display of fireworks in the evening. And here they are in John Martin's Apple Grove, later to become the school. Mr. Thomas was a member of the Wisconsin State Hardware Association, president and treasurer of the village of Menominee Falls, and served several years as a trustee. He was an active member of the Menominee Falls Fire Department and was a chief a term or two, a secretary of the National Mutual Benefit, a charter member of the Menominee Falls Rotary Club, a member of Lincoln Lodge, and other Masonic affiliations. There came a time when many villagers began buying major appliances in Milwaukee. Fritz wasn't happy with this turn of events. 
Locals would buy a new water heater or other appliance and they'd get it home and they'd have no idea how to install or worse yet, they'd install it and really screw it up. Fritz, he would then get a call to fix it. He didn't make any money by selling the device. He only got paid for his time to install the device, but it was a sign of things to come. The big stores in Milwaukee, they could sell items for less than Thomas Hardware could buy them. And the handwriting was on the wall. In 1941, Fritz took his son, Ben, and his son-in-law, Ellie Benstein, into the business, and a corporation was formed. Stock shares were sold, and also at this time, they remodeled the inside of the store. Now that's Fred on the right, and Sport on the left. <laughs> Fred Thomas, the oldest continuous businessman in Menominee Falls, died in 1942. He was occupied in taking inventory in his hardware store with his daughter, Juanita, when he suddenly succumbed to a heart attack. The business continued on in the family until in 1962, one of the oldest family businesses in the falls closed its doors. And what's there now? Pink lemonade. You can still see the old house it's still there on the top. The old house is still there. All they did was change the front. See? Still looks the same. Cool. Well, check that out next time. You even still got the bay window. How cool. So now we're walking out of the hardware stores. The day closes. We're going to use our imagination. A hundred years, hundred, a hundred years earlier, this is what we would have seen across the street. There we go. There's a hotel on the right, and the dance hall is on the left. Peter Keeler built this hotel and dance hall in 1850. At least that's what's written on the back of the picture. Note the Liberty Pole. See, here we go. This, is, this, this, was, this was the Liberty Pole. Up on the top, you can't see real good, but there's a chicken on the top of that, or a rooster. Some kind of poultry, I think it's a rooster. And that meant that the village was of democratic persuasion. It was a liberty pole. So we got the hotel, we got the dance hall, and this we got Friedrich Ney's house. We'll talk about him in a minute. But then we had the liberty pole. You could see it all through the middle of town because it was. this is at the top of the hill. So now the house on the far left belonged to Friedrich Ney's. He was the first man to build a home of stone here in the falls. And it's also said that Michael and Sophia Martin bought this land from Charles Fessenbecker in 1867, and the building wasn't erected until 1860. Well, either way, Martins ran a butcher shop in the basement of the building with a saloon in the front part on the first floor, while the rest of the building was used as a residence. Michael Martin was a stonemason that built the first bridge over the Menominee River. After he died, his widow married Jacob Henrizi, and he was the one who made this building on the left into a large dance hall, which many years later became the show house or the theater. Now, later on, Michael's son, John, operated the butcher shop, and William Minton, a son-in-law, operated the saloon. Now, both John and William were in company with the horse trading barns located in the rear of the building. So now you can even see the horses here, right in the rear of the build this building here. That's where they traded horses. Only horses were sold there, no stock, no cattle, just, just horses. Now, John Reed also had the first harness shop there. William Minton's son, Ben, was actually born in a room in the upstairs of the hotel in September of 1890. And at the same time, Albert Middlestead began his barbershop business. Now, this is Albert in front here. This is Albert. And this is his partner, Oscar Backus. And he's cutting Fred Chambers' hair. We don't know who this guy is. It's another Catholic mystery. So Albert Middlestead began his barbershop business in the basement and ran it there for the next four years. By 1894, Albert moved and had his own barbershop up the street. By 1910, he raised his prices, charging 25 cents a haircut, 10 cents a, a shave, or 12 for a buck. And it only cost a nickel to get your neck shaved. Now Middlestead had a kindly spot in his heart for children. Every child who got a haircut in his shop looked forward to the cookies they would get after the final snip. Now, one particular child had always gotten his haircut at Middlestead's. Then one day his parents decided to take him to another barber, only to find they had to bring him back to Barber Middlestead because the other barber couldn't make the boy sit still. 
Evidently, the child was looking forward to the cookies he would receive after his haircut. Now, by the mid-20s, he opened a new public bathrooms. They were equipped with the latest and best new shower facilities, and they also had tub baths. It was certainly appreciated by the public. Now, Martin Martin operated the dance hall and saloon there for many years. After he left, he built another building up at the Four Corners and established an ice cream parlor. Later on, John Martin built a butcher shop and a livery stable where Glossons and Wobigs was. That's now the Alumni Club. And William Mitten started the Menominee Hotel in 1892, which stayed in the family until 1954 when it was sold to Francis and Sis Schmidt. Now, that's the hotel on the south west corner of the Four Corners. So now, in the spring of 1958, well, let's see, where are we? Hold on. Ah, modern technology. Yeah, okay. So now this, this was, was the hotel. The this was the building on the right, the hotel. In the spring of 1958, it was torn down to make room for the new national supermarket on the right. Can you see that there? Over on the national supermarket, it's the only picture I got. The building on the left stayed, and that turned into the show house. I love this picture. Look, it was taken around Christmas time, you can tell, because we've got some of the old Christmas decorations. You remember those? Got a couple of them here. The coolest thing is, there's one left. There's one. Christmas decoration, and it looks just like that. It says Season's Greetings on it. I got it from Donnie Omehafer in the fire department. We've got it up at Old Falls Village. It still works. We actually have attached it in the wintertime to the caboose that we have out there now, and we, we light it up and turn it on for Christmas every year. It's the last one left in the village. So cool. So... Here we go. Mintons took over and ran the theater there for a few decades, starting in 1919. Now, Helen Stralo, a local writer who grew up here, she remembers. The Falls Theater was the third building south of the Four Corners, next to Schmidt Furniture Store and across from Thomas Hardware in the fire station. By then, it was a gray stucco building with some of the stucco falling off in big chunks, and it was leaving gray lathing with bits of white plaster showing through. A glass frame against the front wall, it held playbills, and a big shaded yard light afforded near the top of the roof gave light to the whole area. Now inside was an extra large room with a small stage at the far end, in front of which now a big movie screen. Dozens of slatted wooden, wooden folding chairs, they were loosely aligned into some semblance of rows, and the hall was multi-purpose. It would serve card parties and dances and graduations and wedding receptions. There was even a set of basketball hoops. The lavatories, one on either side of the stage, their doors marked gents and ladies, were certainly in an embarrassing spot. When you went through the door, you were in the equivalent of an outdoor privy, <laughs> complete with a two-holer seat and old playbills cut in half for paper. <laughs> Yikes. Excuse me. The end of December 1929, talkie movie equipment was installed at our local theater. The opening feature attraction was Red Hot Rhythm, a comedy drama about Tin Pan Alley. The equipment wasn't the greatest. The sound was recorded on a disc, and it was separate from the film itself, so often the sound did not match up exactly with what was on the screen. Well, that changed in November of 33. New movie tone sound equipment was installed. Now, the sound was recorded right on the film so that it couldn't help but be perfectly synchronized. The audience was thrilled. <clears throat> and there's a newer one. Excitement mounted in the village when in May of 1940, our own townsmen were to be movie stars. Ray Zahn had taken ownership of the Village Movie Theater and collaborated with local merchants and businessmen in producing this movie review. It included shots about town showing Menominee Falls civic achievement, school children, civic and industrial organizations, and many other scenes that were of interest. The equipment used was similar to that used by Hollywood Studios. 
in the filming of major productions, and it was to be an all-talky featurette length. It was to be named Menominee Falls on Parade. This is a still taken from Menominee Falls on Parade. The film was made. It was not a talky. It was just a movie, but it was really good. A couple years ago, myself and a couple friends, we went to the cable station, and we watched, we found the original reel, which was put into a digital format, and there was half a dozen of us, and we were taped watching this and trying to, we were making comments on who was who, where was what was what. It was really interesting. You can watch this. It is available on our local cable access, on Falls Cable Access, if you, uh, you can get it online. Or every now and then it's even showed on Channel 14. We weren't around in 1940, no, but we saw the film. <laughs> Jill? Yes? Um, my parents went to St. Mary's, and mm -hmm. in that film, they're seven years old, they had all the kids. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, yeah. 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 They got, I think they did that with St. Anthony's. Could you really? Oh, how neat. Well, there we go. A fire of unknown origin broke out at the Falls Theater Building June 5th, 1940, completely ruining the structure and all of its contents. Costing $22,000 worth of damage, Mr. Zahn, owner and manager of the business, had just run through some films. He was trying them out and getting them ready for that day's matinee. He left, his home across, he left for his home across the street, but some children waiting in line to see that afternoon matinee, they saw smoke coming from the projection room on the second floor. They alerted Mr. Zahn. Luckily, our fire department was right across the street. Our local fire de department couldn't handle it. They even had to call in Lannan and Germantown departments to help. It took over three hours to extinguish those flames. Traffic was rerouted all afternoon. The flames spread quickly through the front of the building from the second floor. The roof caved in and the remainder of the theater was gutted. Thankfully, the fire did not spread to the adjoining buildings. Some of the children had come from Fussville, three miles away, to see the rarely offered matinee. It had 340 seats, most of which would have been filled for that matinee. That building had been the center of many an entertaining evening for young and old. The community felt the loss of the theater and sympathized with the owners. The next day, Ray informed the village that he would tear down the remains of the old building. He would immediately begin building a new and modern, up-to-date theater on the site of the old one. And one of the films he was getting ready to show that day of the fire was Menominee Falls on Parade. That's why it was so exciting when we thought that that film was gone and we came across an original print. On August 20th of the next year, the New Falls Theater opened with 414 seats. Billy the Kid, starring Robert Taylor in Technicolor, was the feature film. Mr. and Mrs. Zahn, owners of the theater, received telegrams of congratulations and good wishes from Mickey Rooney, Judy Garland, Joan Crawford, Robert Taylor, and Greer Garson. Here's a little better pick four months later. The new theater also contained two stores. On the left was Bill Sprin's Barber Shop, and on the right was Mrs. Colway's Floral Shop. And here's a look inside. Now this is the show house I remember. Mm -hmm. That velvet crush, velvet curtain and all the, the red plush seats. Oh, it was a beautiful theater, just a beautiful theater. And it had smoking. Towards the last couple of years, they, had to, they relegated the smoking to what, about the last three rows. Like there was some invisible screen between the <laughs> third and fourth row, I don't know. It was torn down in 73, the year after we graduated. And this is what's there now. So sad. Parking lot. We got the parking lot. So now remember next door where the show house was? That was Friedrich Ney's house. Friedrich Alexander Nays was a Pennsylvania Dutchman born in Bucks County, Pennsylvania. He and his first wife, Catherine Berenger, had five children. Oldest son, Jesse, twin daughters, Hannah and Rebecca, then Charles, and finally, Elvina. The wife, Catherine, died and was buried in Pennsylvania. Through the years, 
Some people have wondered why Friedrich, a 61-year-old widow from out east, would sell everything and uproot his family to Wisconsin. Some have suggested the move was part of a plan to start a Pennsylvania German religious colony in Wisconsin. Another explanation was that the Bishop of the Evangelical Association of North America back in Nays, Pennsylvania hometown had visited members of the church who already were living in this area that became Menominee Falls and, and later went back and touted the virtues of this area to his parishioners. Soon after though is when Friedrich and his son Jesse made several trips here to scout out the territory. Finally, in 1844, the Nays family, all but Charles, along with the William Barnes family, emigrated to Menominee Falls. Charles and his family arrived in the following year. When they arrived, the village was only a log cabin settlement of about 100 people. The area was still very primitive. Roads were mere Indian trails. Deer were said to be as plentiful as sheep, and large packs of wolves were not uncommon. The Indians were still in the area and had a large encampment in the Tamarack Swamp. And another settlement about two miles west off of where Menominee Avenue is now, and one more south on what is now Pilgrim Road, to south of where Hesk's Traveler's Home was. Now even though Friedrich wasn't the first settler in the falls, he was the most important figure in the early development of the downtown Menominee Falls. Nays was a man of financial means. His family was the wealthiest in the area at that time. He was a visionary and was very good at getting things accomplished. Being a practical miller, he was impressed with the use to which the falls in the river might be put. So on June 1, 1844, Friedrich Nays, N-A-S-E, which he later changed to N-E-H-S, bought over 720 acres of land, which included most of the village all along the river, again at the going rate of a buck and a quarter an acre, and he divided it into parcels and sold much of it to his settler friends from back in his original home area. After he was settled, Friedrich was remarried and he took Elizabeth Roth as his wife. I absolutely love this picture. This has got so much in here, it's just, it just I could sit and stare at it for days. We've got the old school, I'm wondering, We've got the old school, and this is, this is Apples and Avenue here. We're on top of the, of the, of the firehouse, top of the firehouse, for point of reference. So we've got uh, Caesar's blacksmith shop. There you can see the, this is the show house, you know, it was the, was the uh, dance hall. Got the hotel, you can see that little archway that was, you know, really on there. Um, oh, Lord, what else you got? We've got the, uh, you can see some of the churches. We've got the churches, that big red church on the hill. Here we got the Four Corners. Oh, Lord, we got Hell's Cash Store right there. We've got the Schmidt Furniture Store. What else do we got? St. Anthony's Church. Do you see that? No, nope, that's St. Mary's. That's St. Mary's. Oh, that's St. Okay. Mary's. Yeah, St. Anthony's would be that way. Yes. This is Appleton Avenue. So, we got St. Mary's. You're looking you can even see the lime kilns. Look at that. Isn't that just incredible? I love this picture. This is just the best so picture ever. For Mr. Stark, are you going to tell us later? Was hmm? it on Schuster's then? No, uh, no, Schuster's was on Main Street. No. Was it? No. Right there? What? Or Where? False Furniture. Oh, False oh, Furniture? There. Oh, False Furniture. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because that was, was Schmidt's. It was Tom, Tom's family. Mm. So, well, let's get back. Where were where, where we? Okay. I'm getting off topic here. Well, not really, but. <laughs> no. Okay, so by 1850, no. Friedrich was the first man to erect a stone building in the village. It was built in 1847. That was the, the house right there. That's like the best picture we've got of it, probably the farthest away, but it was made of local limestone. And later on, that substantial structure was quite a showcase along the highway from Chicago to Green Bay. People would actually stop and look at this house on their travels by. So by 1850, the village had grown to 1,340 people, and this can be attributed to Mr. Nays building three new hillside lime kilns that enabled settlers to build with stone. The lime produced was necessary in chinking log cabins and in making mortar and plaster used in making the stone buildings. Now soon after, now this is all that's left. This is all that's left of his, of his. and they were actually uh, right behind 
the lime kilns now, they were further south. There's nothing left of them anymore now. There's no remnant of them anymore at all, at all now, unfortunately. Well, soon after, a sawmill was also built in the same area by Mr. Nays, thereby ushering in an era of frame house construction in the village. The sawmill was turned over to Friedrich's son, Charles, and with his wealth and initiative, Oh my God, I'm missing a page. <gasps> what, what did I do? Oh, gotten Himmel Achama. Okay. I added something onto one of my pages and I didn't put it back. I suck. Okay, we're going to wing it. So, here we go. You won't know what you missed. Okay, so this is probably one of the oldest pictures in Menominee Falls right here. I can't believe I did that. <laughs> so this is probably one of the oldest pictures in the falls. Look at back there, where all the houses and everything is out. There's nothing there now. This is all cut timber back there. This is the falls right here. This is Main Street. Here's the bridge. You can see all the oxen is eating out of, eating hay out of his uh, out of the uh, wagon. You can see some more horses in there. This was the mill. This was Jesse Nays. Friedrich, Jesse Nays built the mill, and Fried, that was Friedrich's son, Jesse. And then he built this house here, which eventually turned into where Farmers and Merchants Bank was. I love, I love the fence that we got there. So that building is Seamus. Yeah, that's where Seamus was. I can't believe I did that. I am, my apologies. I really suck. Okay, well, we'll keep on going. We'll just, we'll just do the best we can. Okay, so now, Friedrich was a member of Emmanuel Methodist Church. He actually, uh, he donated the land for the church. He's buried right in the front there, one of his front stones. It's right here. He paid for stabling in the back. There was an area for the horses and everything. This is his gravesite up there. You can still find he's buried up there with his family, and Jesse's up there. <laughs> and that's what's there now. That's where Friedrich Ney is. That's what's at his house now. I can't believe I did that. Oh, my God. Actually, two pages. So that's, what does it say? That's where the karate place is. Okay, it's right, just not quite up to, not quite up to the four corners. You can see the Nino's Bakery kind of on the corner there. Lord. Okay. Now I can resume. <laughs> My apologies. Uh, I even went through this before. Now, according to the inscribed plaque, there's a plaque right next to this clock. Uh, it's hanging on the wall right next to the clock. This grandfather clock was brought to Menominee Falls from Pennsylvania in an oxen-pulled covered wagon in 1844 by Friedrich Nays and his family. Now, back in the day, the pioneers had to choose items carefully. They brought bedding and clothing, salt, preserved foods, cooking utensils, tools. These were items that would aid in their survival. There was little space for non-essentials, but this, this was a treasured possession. It was too hard to leave behind. So now this antique clock not only gives phases of the moon, but also days of the month, and it still gives the time of day accurately. Daniel Scheift of Summertown, Pennsylvania, created this work of art in about 1800. All the wood was hand planed. The back isn't finished as smoothly as the front and the sides because these clocks were built to be pushed up and set against the wall so the back would never be seen. The keyhole here the keyhole in the door is of carved bone. Wow. What the heck? Okay. So now, as our village continues to grow, so will its history. And the clock shall remain a reminder to those who love it, of its past with all its rich meaning, a monument not only to Friedrich Nays and his family, but to all those earlier pioneers to whom we owe so very much. Our early pioneers, oh, sometimes you might even be able to see JJ, if you're lucky, you can see JJ winding the clock. Where is that? It's right upstairs. 
You even have time after this presentation to go up to the second floor. When you get up to the second floor, turn left, and the clock is right there. You might even be able to hear it uh, chime. So our early pioneers were all upright people who did everything they could for their families. They tried their best to be good and productive citizens of this village, and for that, we thank them all. The love of their descendants and the esteem of their fellow villagers will forever be theirs. I want to thank you all so much for coming to my presentation tonight, even with the little faux pas. I'm so sorry. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you, thank you. Thank you so very much. I look, I look forward to part two down by the old mill stream. I'm hoping to have it done by next year, so hopefully we'll be back next year with a new one. So thank you all so very much. Thank you. Thank you.